All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Uh, first off, what an amazing turnout. Thanks for coming here bright and early, bright and early for Vegas, of course. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about um, Redshift uh, and what we've been up to recently with recent launches as well as uh, some upcoming launches. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Vidya Srinivasan. I'm the general manager for uh, Redshift. And I'm co-presenting this session with uh, 21st Century Fox. And we have Balaji from uh, Fox. And he's going to talk to us about their journey, their data warehousing journey from an on-prem solution to uh, Redshift in the cloud. And he's also going to touch on some of the lessons learned along the way and some future thoughts on how they expect their architecture to evolve. Uh, it's a pretty full session. Uh, let me get started. So before I jump into Redshift itself, I just want to orient ourselves, because we have a wide set of people who have different backgrounds, in terms of where Redshift really fits into our broader big data portfolio. Uh, so if you look at any big data application, it typically has three phases. There is a collection phase where data gets uh, acquired and collected. There is a storage tier where you have to store the data and then finally analyze it using one of our many solutions. I'm just going to call out a couple of these that are relevant for Redshift. Uh, so for example, Kinesis uh, Firehose is a service that allows you to directly stream data. This is uh, hot data that's coming in from IoT devices and such uh, directly into your Redshift cluster. Uh, when it comes to storage, uh, the key store data, data store for big data applications has become S3 because it's scalable, it's durable, uh, it's fairly cheap, and it's pre pretty much become the default landing zone for big data applications. Uh, when it comes to analytics, we have a bunch of different options. Uh, Redshift, of course, is the data warehousing service, but we also have other uh, offerings such as AWS, Amazon EMR, which is essentially a managed solution to do um, uh, Hadoop, Spark, uh, Hive, et cetera. And uh, Amazon Athena, which is essentially a clusterless query service for directly querying data on S3. Uh, and QuickSight, which is our BI solution. Now to round this all out, we have a couple of solutions in the bottom here. Uh, one is uh, DMS, Data Migration Service, as the name suggests. It's used for migrating data from various sources, be it OLTP or other data warehousing sources into Redshift. And AWS Glue. This is a new service that we announced during the last reInvent. And it serves two purposes. One, it acts as a catalog for the data that you store in S3. So you can know what, what you have where. You can store schemas, et cetera. And it also provides um, ETL capabilities. So essentially, you can set up jobs to do orchestration and data transformations. So that's just the data landscape. Uh, let me also give you a sense for momentum in the market. So we launched Redshift about five years ago uh, at a reInvent. And um, as of uh, second quarter 2017, the Forrester wave called out Redshift as being a leader in the data warehousing segment. And specifically, what they call out is Redshift has some of the largest deployments of data warehouses, as well as the most number of deployments of any cloud solution out there. Uh, now, this is really thanks to all of you, the customers who use the service, who've been supporting it over the years, and, uh, and all the feedback that you've given us to make this better over time. So very quickly, what is Redshift? Uh, Redshift is uh, a fully managed, massively parallel, columnar, uh, petabyte scale data, data warehouse. The couple of things we set out to do when we started this service was to build something that could deliver really high performance SQL analytics. And we wanted to do this in a way that was cost effective for you, as well as in a way that did not require a whole lot of management of the database itself. Now, these are still the guiding tenets for us as we continue to evolve the service. Now, in the years that we've been in operation, we've seen some changes in the overall big data landscape. And we've seen some new use cases emerge for analytics that are slightly different. So Redshift is a clustered solution where you have a leader node and some number of compute nodes 
and you can pick what kind of com how many nodes you want. You can even pick the instance type, whether you want to have an HDD instance or an SSD instance, depending on the cost performance curve that you wish to hit. And it requires the data be ingested into this cluster and then analyzed. Now, in the big data space, in the meantime, what we see is people have started to collect and, first of all, generate, collect, and then store really vast vo volumes of data. And this data is arriving at a really high rate. So now there's all this data pooled in S3, and we see this uh, with our S3 customers. There's just all this data sitting there, and people want to drive value out of that. Now, at core, Redshift is a high-performance SQL processor. And we also want to support use cases that leverage the data in this data lake, what's being called as a data lake. So to do that, <coughs> uh, we announced an extension to Redshift, a new feature called Redshift Spectrum, earlier this year. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so Spectrum essentially is an extension to the Redshift query engine that allows you to directly query your data in S3 without requiring any ingestion or transformations, meaning you can directly query data in open formats. This is quite powerful. <coughs> uh, some of the use cases that we see popular with Spectrum, because it has been in use for some time now, is people like to use Spectrum when they have really hot data and they want to do analytics on that immediately. So as data gets streamed into, S into S3, there is really no time to do the ingest into the cluster, and people run a query across data on S3 as well as data on the cluster as the data arrives. The other popular use case with Spectrum is when you don't access data for, uh, very often. So it's for the less frequently accessed data that still has to be kept around for compliance purposes, or maybe you want to do some analysis once a year uh, to see how trends are over the last 10 years. But it's not really worth it to store all of that in, a, in your warehouse and replicate the data. Uh, so data can be in S3 so that it can be available for historical analysis, except it doesn't have to be in your active data warehouse. And Spectrum allows you to do that. Now, as you can imagine, um, the, the scheme for how you pay for this is also different. For Redshift, you pay for the number of nodes that you use and the time that you use those nodes. It has both the storage as well as the compute. Uh, with Spectrum, the payment model changes. Uh, we move to a pay-per-query type uh, model where you pay for the terabytes scanned for the particular Spectrum query that got run. And we charged $5 per compressed terabyte scanned. So again, it's a lot of flexibility that you can store your data either in cluster or in S3, and you can choose to move, move it between these two places, but still query across the entire data set as if it were one unit. Let me spend a minute on the architecture of Spectrum. So to make Spectrum possible, we essentially had to do two things. The first thing is we created this elastic pool of compute nodes. This is the purple layer that you see here um, that act as, that can take tasks from Redshift and execute that on the data in S3. So they, they would ingest the data as well as execute tasks on the data from S3. And this pool can, is, it can be arbitrarily large, and it's an auto-scaling, multi-tenant fleet that just gets used with every single Redshift cluster as and when needed. The second thing we had to do was we had to build quite a bit of intelligence into the Redshift optimizer itself. We had to make it smarter to understand how to leverage the Spectrum fleet and essentially execute queries against the data in S3, but still with really good performance. And to do that well, we had to make sure that we don't scan more data than we absolutely need to. And we also have to make sure that the data that gets moved across these layers, so between S3 and Spectrum and Spectrum and the cluster, is minimized. So a lot of these optimi optimizer changes went into making Spectrum uh, both very fast and very scalable. Uh, one of the interesting use cases that have evolved after we had Spectrum in the field was uh, customers started to use this pretty much without any local data. So they would even just stand up transient redshift clusters, and you can have any number of them, and directly operate against data sets in S3. 
Uh, the only requirement is the S3 data sets have to be catalogued. They have to be registered either with the Hive Metastore or they have to be registered with, your, uh, with the AWS Glue catalog. I'm not going to go into all the details here. It's a pretty busy chart. But the only point I wanted to make is uh, Spectrum affords us another order of magnitude increase in parallelism. Um, to make that point, let me just show it to you in this diagram. So if you see here, from every redshift node, in fact, every slice in the redshift node can, uh, can access up to 10 spectrum nodes. So if you look at uh, DS28XL, it has 16 slices. And each of these slices can uh, siphon off tasks to another 10 nodes, which makes for some ridiculous levels of parallelism. And this allows us to scale across really large data sets and have very good query performance. And we actually did a test where we ran a complex query. This had a couple of joins. This is the query we ran and some aggregates across the exabyte-sized data set. And we had the results for this query return in under three minutes. I mean, there were multiple techniques that were in play to make this happen. But essentially, the architecture and the optimizer changes were what made it possible. Um, and here is a customer example. So uh, Nuviad is uh, one of the largest attic providers in Israel. And they do both real-time bidding as well as analytics on, uh, on the ads that get published. Now, they had this particular uh, requirement where they had both a large data set. They had petabytes of data. And they were also creating data at a very high rate. Data was they were processing 700,000 transactions per second from over 50 uh, channels. And so they needed to provide these analytic uh, responses to their customers as soon as the data landed. Ingestion just wasn't an option for them because it would just slow things down. So they leveraged Spectrum to essentially get to data as it was arriving in the format that it was arriving. And they did this with multiple clusters as well. And once you have multiple clusters, you can pretty much increase the number of users, the number of concurrent queries you want to run to arbitrary amounts. So this essentially gave them a, a way to scale their storage in S3 pretty much independently of their compute needs, because they could spin up uh, spectrum and redshift clusters as they needed, depending on the particular workload and query volume at that point in time. Switching gears a little bit, um, Redshift is considered to be one of the uh, core services for AWS. And what that means is when AWS launches in a new region, Redshift is there as part of the initial launch. Um, so we are there in 14 regions and adding three more. So pretty, it's pretty widely deployed across lots of uh, places. And we are being used by a pretty wide variety of customers. I just want to point that out. We have customers who have a couple of hundred gigabytes in the service, as well as several petabytes. Um, in fact, Amazon.com stores a very large volume of data and runs a lot of their analytics on Redshift. Um, Black Friday is an interesting day for the service. Um, we also have customers just across different verticals, whether it's healthcare, finance, et cetera. And uh, spending a lot of time on compliance and making sure we had HIPAA compliance, FedRAM, uh, SOC 1, 2, 3, all of these things has helped quite a bit with uh, getting these customers the necessary level of security needed so that they can use Redshift as their choice for data warehousing. A word on partners. So we think, uh, so working with partners has always been a part of the service right from the beginning. And we think it's super critical that uh, we invest a lot of energy in that because our goal is Redshift just slides into your existing infrastructure to the degree possible. And that's possible only if we work with the tools you already use. So be it ETL tools or BI tools, um, we just want to work with the existing infrastructure that you have in place. Now, having a SQL interface and JDBC, ODBC helps us quite a bit because these are all standardized. But even beyond that, we spend quite a bit of time working with our partners to make sure that um, as we evolve and they evolve, we still stay in sync. In fact, with this Fox use case, we work pretty closely with Informatica to make sure the implementation uh, went through without a hitch. 
All right, so moving on to some exciting stuff. Um, so more recent launches. So we recently launched a new node type for our SSD family called DC2. The prior version was uh, called DC1, no surprises there. Um, and you know, if I could do a Black Friday deal for Redshift, this would be it. Because this instance um, offers, on average, 2x better performance for the same price of DC1. So if you're running on DC1, I strongly encourage you to uh, try this out. And these sorts of big numbers come about due to both hardware changes, just the platform is better, this is just better instances, but also software changes that we've made. Uh, so in terms of the hardware itself, uh, DC2s use uh, NVMe drives, and these offer better bandwidth, but more importantly, these offer much higher IOPS. I think it's 1.6 million IOPS for DC2s. And that makes a significant uh, impact to the workloads that you run on top of it. Additionally, the bandwidth from DC2 to S3 is also double what is available in DC1. And that makes a big change to how we run copies and backups and all the operations that go back to S3. Uh, these are also based on a customized, <coughs> customized Broadwell chipset versus the Ivy Bridge that uh, DC1s had. And here is a <coughs> customer quote on the 9x improvement in <coughs> response times that they saw. But we've had pretty um, immediate adoption of this platform just based on performance results. The next thing that I want to pre-announce, this is not out yet, is result set caching. As the name suggests, this is a feature where we figure out uh, results that are worthy of being cached because they're being used again, and we cache them. The cache itself resides in memory on the leader node. And this, if, if you have a workload where you do run the same queries over and over again, which is pretty typical of dashboarding workloads, this can be a very significant performance uh, improvement uh, to what you see otherwise. And essentially what this allows us to do is base, skip the WLM queue, skip processing, no need to do any kind of optimizations, and directly just gets to the results. And pretty much the best part of this feature is that it just works by default. It's transparent to you as a user. Um, once this gets rolled out, which is going to happen uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, the clusters that are currently running will just automatically start using them. And the other point with this is, uh, Apart from the queries that can be cached, it also impacts the queries that are running that cannot be cached, like the copies and the vacuum and everything else, because they just have more resources available to work on them. Everything around what is to be cached, when it's to be invalidated, all of that gets taken care of internally by the service. There are really no knobs to tune here. So here is an example result, of course, uh, this is a workload that we have uh, internally. This is a workload that mimics customer workloads, so we basically have something that has a bunch of um, copies and vacuum inserts, all of that happening at the same time, and it has a combination of queries uh, that can be cached and that cannot be cached. And we saw some pretty significant increase in throughput when we turned on results at caching. So the red bar here is the new throughput with the cache on. And of course, it affects queries that benefit from it, and not so much queries that don't benefit from it. Um, now, here is another result, and this is something we got from a customer uh, that show, talks to the latency of queries, not the throughput, but the latency. So the, um, the part below here shows the latency. So these are all dashboard queries on the y-axis. Each one is a different query. And this shows the latency that they had prior to turning on results at caching. And the bar above is what they saw after turning on caching. And they actually let us know that this is not a mistake. It's just that it was so fast that they couldn't actually plot it. Uh, now, granted, this is a workload that benefited from caching. Every workload isn't going to be so dramatic. But it can still be pretty meaningful, because typically we see workloads have a combination of queries that get repeated and those that don't. OK, so the next feature I'd like to talk about is short query acceleration. 
Uh, this is another performance feature. So the, again, let's talk, spend a minute about the workload itself. So in a, in a typical workload, you have queries uh, that are short running, meaning they take a couple of seconds to execute. Typically for short running queries, what we see is it's usually a user sitting on the other end writing this query and they expect an answer within a short amount of time and they expect, expect consistent performance of these queries because they're probably just getting up in the morning and sending a bunch of queries to see what happened with sales the prior day. And then there are long running queries which could be uh, copies and such, but also long dashboarding queries, etc. With this feature, our goal is to build a system where we automatically identify the short-running queries and essentially create an express lane for them. And, and it comes at a cost. The cost that you pay for creating the access lane is some of the long-running queries, the things that take 45 minutes, will take a little bit longer. They might take 47 minutes. But in our experience and in talking to customers, that hasn't actually mattered because the responsive queries need to come back. If something takes two minutes over 45 minutes, it, it's not really meaningful from a customer experience point of view. So, the, so that was the goal of the feature. Now, it is not always easy for customers to figure out which of the queries coming in are short-running queries. So we take over the burden of figuring that out and automatically moving them to the express lane. And the way we do it is, one, we have an optimizer that gives us a cost that the query will take. Um, but the optimizer isn't really uh, aware of the current uh, run times of the cluster, so how loaded is the cluster, how many users are on it, and things like that. So we actually embedded a machine learning algorithm, a classifier, that can basically learn from your system, from your running cluster, how to take, a, how to take the set of queries that you have and uh, batch them into short running and long running queries. It starts with an initial classifier and relearns every 50 queries. So that way, similar to uh, result set caching, this is a feature that's just transparent. It just works. Uh, once you have this patch on your cluster, it's just going to be active and speed up the short running queries. Uh, now here is a graph that shows some results based on this. So the uh, Orange line is the latency for queries when um, this feature was not turned on. And as you can see, the latency for queries that don't take a very long time, this is the query latency, is pretty high without this feature on, and it goes down significantly once we turn it on. But the latency of the long-running queries do increase a little bit, but that's the trade-off that we've made. All right. Uh, the next feature I'd like to announce is support for uh, nested data. So today you can use nested data with Redshift, but to do so you will have to ingest the data as a string uh, into one of the fields, into a string field, and then use functions to essentially query parts of the nested data. We just wanted to make this super simple. With this feature, we are allowing you to query nested data using a very intuitive dot notation using Spectrum. So you don't even have to ingest the data. You can just directly query the data as is using, um, using an extension of SQL to access the nested fields within the data type. So here we have an example. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Okay. So here is an example. Uh, this is a JSON file that's pretty typical of uh, clickstream data. It has um, a nested field for clicks. And here is a SQL query that basically computes uh, how many clicks per page. For every link on the home page, how many clicks have happened for each of those things. And to access the clicks field, we just had to use a dot notation to get to the uh, clicks and then compute the aggregate. So it makes it very easy to query the data in this format. Mm, and we support open formats like Parquet, or C, JSON, et cetera. Um, I think one of the side benefits of this feature that we've heard from customers is, you know, it's great that we can query this data, but sometimes I just want to ingest this nested data or portions of it into my cluster. I do that today. And this feature actually allows you to write CTAS jobs that are far simpler than what you can do today. So rather than, so if you want to transform 
and load data that is nested into the cluster into flat to normalized tables, this can still help you just run a CTest command for that and move the data in uh, using SQL that is far simpler than running a different job to extract those fields for use within your data warehouse. So that's sort of the side benefit of, uh, of this feature. <clears throat> so here is a, an example where it's an orders and customer table where uh, this, I'm just bad with this clicker. Um, where on the top, it's a, it's a normalized table if you were to um, put it in a data warehouse in a flat format. And this is how it would look in nested format. The only point I want to make is with nested data, you do get better query performance because essentially the, the fact that it's nested is equivalent to have done a pre-join of those tables. So if your query patterns are such that you're going to join the data anyway, it's worthy to think about, hey, maybe you want to leave it in the nested format and query it directly because it'll actually perform better. <clears throat> and the last thing that I want to announce today is um, enhanced monitoring. <clears throat> so we have a console for Redshift in our administrative console where you, you get different parameters about CPU usage, IO rates, et cetera. Uh, we are putting a lot of energy into improving that entire console experience to manage cluster and have better visibility into what is actually happening. <clears throat> and the goal here is to understand what is happening with your cluster easier and also to troubleshoot in case you end up having issues uh, for simple problems. like. If you feel like this cluster is slow, we want to be able to give you enough data on the console that lets you understand what might have happened to make that happen. Or first of all, to even know um, in, in absolute terms if indeed the cluster is slow or if something else is going on. So a couple of fields that we will have immediately is uh, a metric for query throughput and query uh, latency. And these are metrics for, I mean, these are five-minute metrics that get aggregated over five-minute periods, but then you can uh, display them for the time frame. You can pick the time frame that you want to display them. And this is really just a start. These are just two things that we're going to start with, but you'll see a lot more along uh, monitoring. Some closing thoughts before I hand off. So highly recommend folks who use DC1s to look at DC2, especially the 8XL platform is um, significantly better in performance. And in fact, it's true for even DS2 customers. If, you, if you're using a DS2 cluster, but it's not very high in storage utilization, it's worthwhile to take a look at um, uh, DC2. Um, as we talked, uh, talk today, Spectrum extends the capabilities of Redshift and provides a great e deal of flexibility in how you can organize your data and query on it. And there are more features coming for it, such as nested data support, there'll be more. Um, again, if you haven't tried it, it's worthy to check that out. And there's, there are significant improvements. I mean, we talked about uh, results at caching and short query acceleration today. Uh, we announced another feature called query monitoring rules earlier this year, which essentially allow you to set up rules for your cluster for your queues in the cluster so that you can automatically um, either kill or hop uh, runaway queries. So if a query is uh, spilling a lot to disk or if it's just going to hog up all the resources in the cluster, you can just automatically kill it. When these features sort of come together and are used in tandem, we see customers able to drive pretty significant throughput improvements uh, to their clusters. So again, something to think about and look at. And as always, if you have questions, suggestions, feedback for us, uh, please use this alias to let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya. Good morning, everyone. I am Balaji Muthuram Malingam, Executive Director, Data and Analytics at 21st Century Fox. Next 15 minutes, I'm going to share our most recent analytics modernization project experiences that we did it for our studio side of the business. Fox Film Entertainment, it's a part of 21st Century Fox, and we are one of the largest movie-making studios in the world. We produce and distribute great content, reaching global audience in theater and at home 
through these customer platforms and broadcasters in 193 countries and 63 languages. We have many analytical processes and solutions that supports our business decision-making process. Let me give you key highlights of those processes. We process about 100 terabytes of data on a daily basis. There are about 25,000 user requests run on our system. Having more than 100 data providers provide data to us. Also, about 3,500, sorry, 35,000 data pipelines that process the data, crunch the data on any given day. We have many challenges that go beyond our technology. In general, there is a huge digital transformation in our media industry. Our consumer is changing. They have many options now in the way they, how they consume our content. It called our system to be much faster in terms of ingesting the data, providing a quicker insight. Also, it called us to process vast amount of data and variety of data. On the other hand, we were in a traditional data warehousing platform at its end of life, having multiple unplanned outages, struggling to uh, scale. We had many options, but we know that it is not going to help us to grow in terms of meeting our business needs. So we decided to modernize our analytical platform with few key principles. Here are our key principles. First, democratizing the data. Again, it's a wide and broader subject to discuss. But we are very clear. We want to bring all our data to a common platform and bring down our data silos and provide a cross-functional visibility to our business so that they can take a best decision out of our own data. Next, cloud. Leverage the cloud that offers in terms of scale and elasticity through which design our solutions much faster and nimble in nature. Also, we want to have a cost-efficient solution so that we can scale. So considering all of our complexities, enterprise scale in nature, we were looking for a solution or a partner with a wide suite of analytical tools. And it's our natural choice to partner with Amazon. We partnered together. We finalized our approach and architectures by conducting multiple pilots and also flushed out an aggressive project plan to make this happen in six months. It is our conceptual architecture that supports our modernization. As you see here, from the left to right, we collect the information, store the data, and analyze and do further analytics out of it. And at, at collect layer, we have schedule and ingest and data transfer. And the key difference, what we are making it from our modernization standpoint, we are bringing a data lake with a vast object storage and having an, a SQL MPP platform on top of it. It clearly, it clearly answered our, all our challenges and also met our principles. We have a, now we can scale our data also with very cost efficiently. Here is our software and technology stack that supports our architecture. Traditionally, we were having multiple scripts to collect and ingest the information. What we have done it as a part of this project, we standardize it in the Python framework and use Lambda for serverless scale. Also, we were using Informatica for our data transformations and data ingestion tool. It collects the sources from the source system and provide and put it in our S3 bucket on its raw format. 
Also, we have a Glue ETL for EMR and Redshift uh, data load use cases. And also using Informatica pushdowns for our Redshift data loads. We are using Glue Gatlock for tagging and creating a metadata out of our data lake. So it will provide a data dictionary for us. And using MicroStrategy as our visualization tool and provide a data product for our end users, it directly reads it from S3 and Redshift. As you might expect, we experienced many challenges, also learned multiple lessons. Here are our key learnings out of this entire project. As we are coming from a traditional background, as we limited with our size and scale, we, in, we started with a large cluster, and down the line we find out splitting the cluster between the read and write, it's the most appropriate thing for our use cases. Now we have a smaller clusters with the multiple use cases for read and write, and also it helps us to get a great flexibility if we need to run a heavy hit Heading reports during the month end or quarter close, we can have a read cluster, bigger cluster, and then we can bring it down after the period. The next thing is the vacuum and tables. Initially, we were seeing a huge growth in terms of our cluster sizing. Then we realized that, already I mentioned that we are processing about 100 terabyte of data. We were seeing a lot of like, data delete blocks accumulated in our clusters. Then we changed our vacuum strategy in a way that we can do it on a weekly and daily, in fact, in a, in a monthly basis. Now we are managing our cluster size properly. Similarly, analyze. In a mid-week point, we were seeing a degradation in per query performance. That also, like same uh, traditional background, we were having an analyze at the end of each week or a downtime when the business was not running the reports. Then we changed our design in a way that we put our analyze at the end of the data pipeline and we started to analyze the objects most appropriately. The performance difference is a day and night difference. We got a great performance. The commit queue, it's an another interesting one. Redshift is so sensitive in terms of commits, it always channels all their commits through the leader node. We've been doing a lot of commits, uh, I explained earlier, like we were using the Informatica pushdown to do that. Then later we realized that it's completely clogged our commit queues in the leader node. Then work with the partners and change the design in a way that we make it as a bigger batches and provided a less commits. For example, a, a data pipeline for our products, it used to run for 43 minutes. After this change, it, it ran for four minutes. Very impressive. Schema design, that also an interesting learning. We were hitting like a kind of a disk space issues. Huh? often when heavy reports or heavy data loads process in our system. Lately, we found it there are a lot of rebroadcasting is happening in between the clusters. Then we work with uh, AWS and uh, our partners. We redesign our keys in a way that like redistributed across all nodes and changed our short keys. We got a great execution plan now, and we resolve those issues. Another interesting one is workload management. We have different use cases. We have continuously running reports and some broadcasting reports, as well as heavy hitting data science uh, SQL hitting our systems as well. What we have done is we divided those by appropriate rules, setting up the queues, also, dynamically, we changed it according to our use case change. Also, we closely engage with AWS and their processor. Their rich experience is really important and is priceless when you are having a project like this scale 
and going against time, this, this pace is so important. So here is our benefit. We absolutely got a business agility after this project. Now we are completely empowered. Now we are making our business also empowering. Now we can take any data at scale, and we can scale it whenever we need it as well. More than that, we are seeing a very tangible benefit in addition to this agility. We reduced our overall overhead cost about 10 to 15 percentage. And also, we decommissioned hundreds of our servers, released our data center footprint. Now we can proudly say that our studio analytics run on cloud. Also, we have 30 to 35 percentage of process improvement and efficiency across the board, across all applications. I want to mention one more thing. It's not just an, a platform alone helped us to help get this benefit. The partnership, how we got together with Amazon. Whenever we ask for a enhancements or a bug fixing, always they listen to us. They appropriately they released it on time. Also work closely with hand in hand. Helped us to meet all the milestones on time. It is a great partnership. So from here, where are we going? Amazon is innovating fast. At the same time, at Fox, we are embracing those innovations much faster. Vidya just now mentioning about all those new features. We are already working with them and releasing it. In fact, we released a few of them into our production systems. We upgraded to DC2. We saw a great performance, like it's about 50 to more than 50 percentage. Also, we released a short query accelerator, and we are seeing a great performance for our microstrategy related use cases, where our list of value or, or a prompts, it comes out really in sub-seconds. And Spectrum, it got our data lake to the next level. Now we are dividing our compute need as well as data need totally separate. We no longer need to put our cold data into Redshift. Spectrum does it for under the hood, blend it nicely, and provide it as an end result. Query result caching, that still we are evaluating it. We are seeing a promising results, looking forward to implement it. Also, we are expanding our data lake to our next uh, other business units based on the experience we got it from our studio implementation. Also working on a project to provide a real-time analytic solutions through using through Kinesis. So excited to extend our data lake to provide deeper insights and predictive insights using machine, lang machine language and AAs. Hope it helps for you guys. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you.